So these are my disclosures. And the objectives of this short talk are to understand really what delayed ejaculation and anorgasmia are by the numbers, uh, to review the pertinent anatomy and physiology, uh, because that's really kind of the key to treatment, certainly from the urologic perspective and what we can do for these men in the clinic, uh, review what's known about the causes of DE and anorgasmia, and that also contextualizes how we approach it, how we, how we approach treatment, and finally talk a little bit about the management and some of the evidence there. And I will sort of predicate that by saying there is actually fairly little evidence with regards to the uh, medical therapies for these, for these conditions. So what are these conditions? So uh, delayed ejaculation and anorgasmia, by definition, are the persistent or recurrent delay, difficulty, or absence of orgasm after sufficient sexual stimulation that, and this is key, causes personal distress. So by the numbers, we define it using a metric called intravaginal ejaculatory latency time, or IELT. So this is sort of medical speak for saying how long can a man last in a woman. And normal or median is about five minutes. So delayed ejaculation is defined as mean plus two standard deviations, which works out to about 25 minutes. So if you are working for 25 minutes or more, you have delayed ejaculation. If you cannot orgasm, that's anorgasmia. And the incidence of these conditions is actually higher than one might expect. So it ranges between two and 11%. It's a fairly common sexual dysfunction. And this depends in part on the definition used, and that depends on what your IELT threshold is. Now, you know, the part, the challenge to measuring IELT is that not every guy or very few of us actually take a stopwatch with us into the bedroom. Um, so these studies aren't always the easiest to do. So I wanted to walk through the pertinent anatomy and then the neurochemistry of this just so we can contextualize it because it's really important to understand these things from when you're approaching the patient. So ejaculation is a separate event from erection, can, can occur in the absence of erection, and the neuroanatomy is, includes sensory input from the glands at levels S2 to 4, and I'll show this in a pretty picture in a minute, which results in periurethral muscle contraction. This is followed by emission, which is regulated by sympathetic inputs from T12 to L1, and this results in contraction of the vas deferens, seminal vesicles, and prostate, and bladder neck to prevent retrograde ejaculation up into the bladder. And then this is finally followed by expulsion, which is dependent on somatic inputs, also from S1 to 3 which is bulbocavernosis and spongiosis contraction resulting in projectile ejaculation. Boom. Um, this is what it looks like on a, on a picture where you have your sympathetic centers, which are uh, uh, from T12 to L1, which govern emission, and then your expulsatory and secretile centers in, uh, in the uh, sacral spinal cord. The messages are conveyed via the pudendal nerve. And then centrally, the pons the nucleus paragigantocellularis in the pons is your uh, sexual response area of the brain. Neurochemistry-wise, and, and again, this understanding of the neurochemistry of, of ejaculation really helped me contextualize um, uh, treatment, which is why I, I keep s stressing this part. But to, under, to know that norepinephrine and serotonin are sort of the downer neurohormones here, meaning they repress... Uh, ejaculation when in high levels, and that dopamine is an upper, meaning if you can increase your dopamine levels, you can potentially mitigate negative effects of high norepi and serotonin. And finally, that prolactin is also a downer that is involved in the refractory period and in general in preventing ejaculation, then you can, you have a scaffold by which to approach treatment, and we'll talk about that. Also, I wanted to call out SSRIs as sort of the heavy in the room in terms of causing a lot of male and female, for that matter, sexual dysfunction. So because these are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they raise serotonin levels and can cause sexual dysfunction, and the most common sexual dysfunction among these in men is anorgasmia. So to put it into a pictorial format, here you can see the dopamine, oxytocin, and nor norepinephrine and their respective roles in improving desire, arousal, and orgasm. And you can see how serotonin and prolactin can negatively inhibit or negatively impact uh, these processes. So, you know, just in schematic form, something to think about. Other hormones that are really important in the ejaculatory process and orgasmic process include testosterone. So um, androgen receptor is ubiquitous throughout both the female and male bodies, uh, including in the pelvic floor. And while not completely defined, um, 
premature ejaculation has been associated with high testosterone as well as low testosterone, and low testosterone has been associated with delayed ejaculation in some men. Thyroid hormone follows a similar trend as testosterone, so high thyroid uh, levels re can result in premature ejaculation and low in delayed ejaculation. We already talked about prolactin, and I just wanted to talk a little bit more about it because this can be a surrogate of serotonergic activity. So if your prolactin is high, it may be an indicator that serotonin levels are higher than they should be. And prolactin also suppresses testosterone production um, and uh, is important in the ejaculatory process. And finally, oxytocin. So this surges during ejaculation, and that is the concept behind treatment with oxytocin. Because if you can induce an oxytocin surge, Theoretically, you should be able to induce ejaculation. That's also part of the problem with treating men with oxytocin because you have to have them take it intranasally at the point at which they would like to have an orgasm, not exactly spontaneous uh, sexual intercourse. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about causes. And I, I don't have time to go into every one, so I wanna, I'm, I'm trying to provide folks with kind of a scaffold because where it really gets kind of interesting and, and relevant is when, when we talk about treatment. So the determin determinants of IELT range from everything from genetics to neurophysiology, behaviors, psychosocial and cultural influences, right? That determines how we engage with our partners. Somatically, just by the book, aging, neurologic, and endocrine disorders, which we've already mentioned several of in the context of the neurohormone, and medications can really significantly impact a man's ability to orgasm. And this is, this is the list of known medications that impact ejaculatory function. I've highlighted some of the more common ones, including all SSRIs. So more, m most of these are actually SSRIs, but alcohol is on here as well. But you can see the list is extensive. So um, in, in your patients, it helps to actually go through their medication list, especially those who are on numerous or, or on one or more psychotropic medications to see if those might impact uh, their ejaculatory function. When we talk about treatment and contextualize it, we think about psychotherapy, sex therapy, and pharmacotherapy. Now, I'm not intending to go through this. This is very complex, but I wanted to put this diagram up here pulled from a review because it just highlights how many potential different avenues and combinations of treatment there can be for ejaculatory issues. And it also highlights the fact that there's a marriage in several cases of both sort of medical therapies as well as psychosexual therapies. And you can see that psychosexual therapy is a mainstay in numerous approaches to treatment over here, and it's something that should not be overlooked and considered in almost every case. So, you know, the question when we're treating these men is, well, when, when should we send them to a sex therapist? When should a sex therapist be involved? You know, I, I would say that probably more often than not, but if you're going to go by the book, then in the, in the absence of any obvious organic cause of delayed ejaculation or when heavy psychosexual factors are suspected, then a sex therapist is strongly recommended and partnering with one is a, is great we have we have a wonderful uh, we have several wonderful sex therapists in Houston um, that we work with and princip in principle um, I try to have a patient's partner come to their clinic visit with me and, and it's also something that should be encouraged when these patients seek therapy just to improve communication be between partners and um, have this be a partner issue or a couple issue. So I, I wanted to segue away from medical therapy just for a moment and talk very briefly about theories of psychological delayed ejaculation and treatment. And this is just to, again, provide context for this. So Stan Altoff is a sex, is a, um, sex therapist in um, Florida, and these are his theories of uh, delayed ejaculation and the potential psychological etiologies of these. And you'll see that the, the treatment approaches that he suggests are very reasonable, but also vary depending on the condition. So for insufficient stimulation, you have a combination of psychosexual therapy and penile vibratory stimulation or PVS. Whereas with psychic conflict, and you'll see with desire disorder, psychotherapy is the, are the mainstay. And with idiosyncratic masturbation, then you have masturba masturbatory retraining and revision of fantasy to bring folks back in line with what's uh, normal, with, with uh, societal norms or uh, sexual norms. 
Another um, context for thinking about sexual dysfunction in general, um, and this is, this is helpful in thinking globally about sexual dysfunction, is Mike Perlman's sexual tipping point model. And what you can see here are two sides of the scale, uh, in balance here, but um, you can imagine how the excitatory and inhibitory stimuli on the left and on the right can alter the sexual balance. So here we're talking about psychological, behavioral, social, cultural, and interpersonal and biological factors. So when any one of these types of factors predominate, you can lead to either excitation or inhibition of the sexual response. And put in the context of ejaculation, you know, when you have the proper combination of sex steroids, dopamine, norepi, melanocortin, oxytocin, so on and so forth, you'll get excitation. And conversely, when your serotonin, prolactin, endogenous opioids are too high, then that's inhibitory in the ejaculatory process. So um, I've got about seven or eight more slides, and we'll go straight to pharmacotherapy because this is the part that should interest most of the audience here. But I'm going to start by saying that there is absolutely no medication for DE that is currently approved by the US FDA. Furthermore, with regards to pharmacotherapies, there are no clinical trials demonstrating efficacy. The, any clinical trials that have been done have been tiny, and you'll see one. St most studies, or in, in effect all studies, are small, underpowered, retrospective, and uncontrolled. And some of the disparities in outcomes likely reflect the use of different populations here. So this is the list of medications that we can consider for the use of delayed ejaculation, and I'll, I'll kind of hone this down to the, uh, to the highlights. So just kind of put, put in the context of our desire, excitement, and orgasm um, neurohormones picture, you can see how some of these therapies impact dopamine, oxytocin, and norepi levels, prolactin levels in the setting of cabergoline, which is a favorite, and you'll see that in a moment, and opioids and then uh, serotonin levels in the setting of buspar. Um, and I believe we shared these slides, so this should all be uh, accessible to you guys in more detail um, after the meeting. So some additional general guiding principles in the setting of delayed ejaculation with concurrent erectile dysfunction, you should treat the ED first and use penile vibratory stimulation in, uh, in challenging settings, uh, about a 70% success rate. And then just drug-wise, in anybody who's on an SSRI, the most helpful thing to do is switch them to, bu uh, to bupropion if possible. And finally, cabergoline is also another top choice for medical management, and we'll see some of the data underpinning that. So there's, we're, I'm going to talk now about treatment of SSRI-induced and non-SSRI-induced delayed ejaculation, contextualize it, go through several, of, uh, several studies, and then close. So for SSRI-induced delayed ejaculation, bupropion is the go-to drug. It's the, best, it's the best choice. Ciproheptadine is the second choice, and loratadine is the third choice, and I'll bring up another slide with that in a minute. Um, for treatment of delayed ejaculation where no SSRI is involved, then cabergoline is the go-to um, or oxytocin, depending on what prolactin levels are. And again, I'll highlight that in a minute. So, you know, just to sort of talk about how these treatments are used in, um, in reality, the SMSNA did a survey of their, of their uh, membership and showed that cabergoline, bupropion, oxytocin, and ciproheptadine, just like we put in the context of, um, of the past couple of slides, are the most popular treatments for, um, or the, the most popular first-line treatments for delayed ejaculation. And that's because they have the most evidence supporting them, supporting their efficacy, even though that evidence is not great. Okay, so um, I already mentioned this, but again, just to highlight, make the switch to bupropion if you can. If you can't, start ciproheptadine, and if, uh, if that's not working, then you can try loratadine. Uh, the big nasty side effect potential for bupropion is uh, suicidality, so certainly something to watch out for and do in the context of help with your um, mental health professional. Patients not on an SSRI, it's important to check prolactin levels. And uh, Dr. Caro talked about some of that in the context of uh, uh, hormone management. But if the prolactin level is high or normal, then cabergoline is the go-to because cabergoline will lower prolactin levels. And then if prolactin is low or low normal, then consider oxytocin, which can uh, trigger that surge and potentially lead to um, orgasm. And then yohimbine is considered a backup agent along with several others, and you'll see the, the evidence supporting that. So a few studies, so bupropion for SSRI-induced sexual dysfunction. So Ashton and Rosen in 98 published a study of 47 men with SSRI-induced sexual dysfunction. They uh, used 75 versus 150 milligrams of bupropion 
PRN prior to sex. And then if that didn't work, 75 milligrams three times a day for two weeks in non-responders. What they found, and you'll see this with all the studies basically, that about two-thirds of patients responded. Um, Very few discontinued, and overall they found that fixed-dose bupropion may work better than PRN. And just to contextualize other studies, they have had mixed results. This was the biggest and most positive study for bupropion in the setting of sexual dysfunction and delayed ejaculation. So ciproheptanine is also used for SSRI-induced sexual dysfunction, in part because it is a serotonin antagonist. And Ashton Hamer and Rosen in 97 looked at a large cohort of men on SSRIs, found about 100 with SSRI-associated sexual dysfunction, treated 45 of these with yohimbine, amantadine, or ciproheptadine. And I know this slide's about ciproheptadine, but what they found was actually that yohimbine was more effective than either of the other two. Um, And in part, that's why it's a backup. Um, But again, you know, the only other studies available on these three medications, or actually rather ciproheptadine really, are case reports and a partial response to ciproheptadine has been reported in these studies. So cabergoline is a dopamine receptor agonist. It lowers prolactin levels and can decrease the refractory period in men. So our group in 2016 published a study of 131 men. So this is probably the biggest study out there, even though it was retro- retrospective and had numerous um, numerous limitations. So these men were treated with carbergaline twice a week for orgasmic disorder. Um, the duration of treatment and subjective treatment response, so meaning better orgasm or not better orgasm, or did you reach orgasm or did you not reach orgasm, were recorded, so it was binary. Um, and what we found was about, well, about two-thirds of men reported improvement in orgasm, and this improvement was not actually impacted by testosterone level or whether these men were on therapy, their age, or any history of prostatectomy, with all of which can contribute to sexual dysfunction. With oxytocin, so I already mentioned that there's a surge in oxytocin during orgasm in men, and this can decrease the ejaculatory latency period in animals. So this is the only double-blinded placebo-controlled study of any of these drugs, but look, it was tiny. 10 healthy men treated with oxytocin intranasally followed by a washout period. And again, this was a crossover study. And the authors examined oxytocin and catecholamine levels as well as sexual arousal, but didn't actually go to the level of orgasmic evaluation. So what they found was expected, as expected, increased oxytocin and catecholamine levels. And the majority of men with increased sexual arousal, but no data on orgasm. And finally, with yohimbine, so yohimbine can be tr- used for SSRI-induced delayed ejaculation because it acts at the level of the spinal cord adrenergic receptors, so it bypasses a lot of central processes. And it's used to treat ED and sexual dysfunction. And um, the only study out there that was worth anything, sorry, that was blunt, um, had 29 men treated with 20 milligrams of yohimbine. I can be like that sometimes. Um, 20 milligrams of yohimbine then converted to 50 milligrams if not effective. And what they found again was about two thirds of men reached orgasm with a minority, actually only a minority needing penile vibratory stimulation to reach orgasm. So the majority of these meds again have very few data available. The data that are available show about a two thirds response and um, we need better data. But to summarize, orgasmic function is dependent on an interplay of numerous neurohormonal and physical factors. So it's important to, to keep in mind all of these things when treating the patient. Um, the go-to neurohormones are norepi, serotonin, dopamine, and prolactin, and oxytocin, I would add to that list as well. Um, these conditions can be caused by many medications, in particular SSRI. So it's important in these patients to address their medication list and to, see, and to see what might be contributory and fix it if you can or have one of your colleagues fix it, um, not urologists, another specialty. And treatment should certainly include both psychosexual and medical therapies where appropriate, depending on the etiology. But medical therapies are currently poorly studied and not FDA approved for this condition. So I'll close with that, and we'll take any questions for the last two talks.